Um, so I've been joined by um, Professor Michael Ash. Um, let me let me make some adjustments here. And uh, Professor Ash is uh, the professor of economics and public policy at UMass and Amherst, uh, and he's also the chair of the Department of Economics. Uh, he is a Ph. He has a PhD from University of California in Berkeley, and uh, he is a I have been trying to connect. Let me let me start that sentence again. I've been trying to connect with him for some time, and he's been so patient and so flexible that I'm excited to have him on today. Professor uh, Michael, how are you today? Hi, Ben. Thank, um, great, thanks. Th thanks for having me on. It's really an honor to be here. My, my pleasure. Uh, I'm glad that we could connect. And uh, if you would, before we jump into the conversation, because there's uh, we want to talk about basic income and I want to talk about one of the papers that you wrote. Um, but just tell, tell us a little bit about what you study and some of your fields of expertise. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so actually I've been uh, enjoying the show this evening, or enjoying is not the right word for it. You know, I've been very disturbed by the show. I do a lot of work on um, equity and justice in the economy in the United States. So mm -hmm. I'm especially interested in environmental justice. Uh, that's how the bads in the environment and the goods in the environment don't get equally shared. So that's something I spend a lot of time on. Mm -hmm. I'm also interested in uh, the work that workers do and how much they get paid for it and um, why uh, what workers have been paid has been uh, slipping over the last 40 years. You know, basically mm -hmm. over, not, it's not in my adult life, my entire life, uh, there's been enormous slippage in the uh, well-being of workers in, in the U.S. And I'm interested in understanding uh, why that's happened and maybe more importantly, what can be uh, what can be done about it? OK, so we just added something else to our conversation tonight. I definitely want to talk about that, uh, about the um, some of the efficiencies that we see. The, the the labor market is more efficient, but the gains from that efficiency that we don't we don't realize it's it's going in terms of profits, but it's not going to labor. Uh, and it sounds like this is some uh, within of, of your realm of study, if I'm hearing you correctly. Yes, that, that's right. That's something I'm very interested in. I think it actually ties quite closely to um, to a basic income guarantee, to the idea of a basic income. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can uh, maybe connect those. I mean, yeah. one of one of the one of the reasons for a basic income is uh, kind of for workers to take back uh, some of their own. Uh, you know, the economy is enormously more productive than it used to be. Mm -hmm. You you described it as you know more efficiency in the labor market. We get a lot out of every uh, more out of every hour of work by a lot than we did in say 1975. And it's really quite amazing that uh, you know workers are uh, not taking home a lot more than they uh, took home in 1975. All right, so uh, despite, you know, let's, let's take a second here to, um, to define. Um, I think when we say basic income, um, some people may not even know what we're talking about. Um, how would you define for a, you know, just the average listener uh, what basic income is? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So a basic income uh, means that um, uh, the state or, or some collective that we produce, will, uh, that we create, will uh, send a basic amount of money to every person, every uh, woman, man, child uh, in, in the country on an annual basis. And they, all they have to do is be themselves. They don't have to work for that. They don't have to... Um, you know, they, 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 they don't have to uh, demonstrate that they are uh, deserving or meritorious. Mm -hmm. It's simply an income that you receive to, um, to defray some of the costs of, uh, some, some of, the co cost of living. Um, it's an idea that's been around for a pretty long time. It actually has American, uh, American roots. Uh, Tom Paine, mm -hmm. uh, the revolutionary, uh, the, the, the revolutionary at the time of the American Revolution, the real revolutionary, <laughs> Uh, was in favor of a uh, of a guaranteed basic income, and again, the idea was just that uh, to be a full participant in a society in our society, you need some income to start with, and you should have that income whether you do something that a capitalist wants to pay you for or not. It's just something that you have a right to, um, that uh, and, and and that enables you to be a full participant. So you know, we could talk about amounts. People want to get their sort of head wrapped around it. You know, I think a basic income that we could start thinking about is, you know, that I think is on, actually on the table in some places is, you know, thinking about maybe uh, four to ten thousand dollars, somewhere between four thousand and ten thousand dollars per person per year. So if you had a family of four, you'd be talking about an a before work income 
of you know something on the order of you know say fifteen to forty thousand dollars. Wow. Higher amounts would cost. You have to think about where that comes from. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So let's let's unpack the implications that has. Right. So I, I remember in in undergrad, I think I was a freshman in college in my basic economics, uh, uh, my macro economics. Uh, I remember being after class and just sitting there thinking, I'm like, why haven't we why don't we invest a certain a block amount of money into a person as soon as they're born into uh, a born uh, American citizen? Why don't we put money into their hands because or into some type of account? because money that we that the government spend is spends is obviously going to be spent and stimulate the economy so you know just from that one single thought you know i've kind of been following this this conversation on basic income that really hasn't gone very far because we hit this hiccup of um, the fear of socialism and the fear of communism and the fear of a welfare state. Um, and so I know that's more of the, on the political side of it, but just in terms of your vantage point, um, how is this not, or how could we convince people that this is beneficial economically and not just something that's a welfare state that's going to crush our economy? Right. Well, actually, let me just mention, uh, with respect to the politics, um, basic income has kind of funny, has a funny following. It certainly has a following on the left. Mm -hmm. And people would like to see a fairer society, frankly, a more, social, more socialist society. But it also has a pretty long-standing subscribership on the right. So two big advocates of basic income, and this may come, you know, I, I found this sort of somewhere between shocking and amusing, were uh, Milton Friedman and Frederick Hayek, who were kind of, you know, uh, godparents on, uh, on the American economic right. Their image of it is that it would replace, and I think this is a bad idea, but I'm just describing their image, that it would replace um, uh, means-tested, uh, means-tested welfare support or specific subsidies for particular needs like subsidized housing or subsidized food with food mm. stamps. So, um, you know, uh, in their more generous moments, and there weren't very many, but in their more generous moments, they were in favor of just sending, um, just sending poor people what they need most, which is money. So mm. this actually has kind of funny, as I said, there's kind of funny subscribership. I, I want to back off that now and talk about more kind of what life, um, what life would look like with, uh, with the basic income guarantee. And for, to, from my perspective, one of the big attractions is that it would free people from the tyranny of bad work, which is uh, just a terrible, a terrible, terrible use of people's, uh, of people's lives. Uh, people could be much more uh, choosy about what work they do. I think it would put a lot of pressure on employers to mm -hmm. um, make work engaging and interesting, um, and that uh, I think a lot of good might come out of it. It might actually spur a lot of growth in the economy. You already mentioned, I think you were absolutely um, on, on, on target, that this would be highly stimulative for an economy that has really been in the doldrums. I mean, uh, and one of the main reasons is that, you know, lots of working households just don't have enough money to spend. Right. So this would be highly stimulative at a time when we need it. I have to definitely go back and find uh, Friedman and Hayek actually advocating for basic <laughs> income. I have uh, Hayek's uh, The Road of Feudalism on my desk right now, and I have yeah. to see if he, you know, where did he make that quantum leap? I, I have to go see it. But I'll take your word for it. I believe, I obviously believe you <laughs> on it. Um, so so it can be stimulative. It, do you see it as a solution to poverty? And that's, that's a so big question. Yeah. So that's a good question. So I think that, that poverty is one of the areas where it might be most effective. I don't think it's a solution to inequality, and we should come back to that. Okay. I think it's an important step, but it might be a solution to poverty because it simply puts in the pocket of everybody in the country, um, re regardless of, again, you know, being deserving poor or, you know, uh, or, or, or the amount of work that they do. It puts enough to pay the basic bills, I, I guess if we choose if we choose an amount large enough, okay. it's enough to pay the basic bills in the uh, pockets of every household in the country, and that's a pretty big step towards overcoming the kind of fundamental deprivation of of, of genuine poverty. Mm -hmm. Might not be enough to tackle the kind of inequality we've been seeing, but poverty, I think, it's a really good uh, it's it, it is a really good potential step. So, yeah. would you? Um... 
do you think it's if we couldn't fix inequality, would it be sufficient for us to just fix poverty? In my opinion, no. Uh, the amount of inequality that we've seen, the, the pace at which it's grown over the last, uh, really since about 1978, 1980, uh, is, is really extraordinary. And it upsets so many other, the inequality upsets so many other balances, political balances completely disrupted by um, the massive growth of the wealth of the, of, you know, what um, the French economist uh, Thomas Piketty labeled, you know, the 1%. Um, so, so I don't think it's enough to confront, um, to confront poverty, but let, let's come back to basic income, which I think is a good first step in that direction. Uh, we could hold it up against some alternatives. And I guess I'm kind of excited about it as a piece of a larger, as you know, maybe a piece of a larger set of solutions that would help on poverty, that might help on certain parts of inequality, even if it wouldn't be quite the same as, um, as uh, reining in the extraordinary growth at the high end the income distribution. So again, for, 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 for your uh, viewers, I would you know, say, well, we could think about this basic income guarantee. There are other approaches. So for example, we could think about minimum wages or living wages. Mm -hmm. Those are intended, obviously, for people who, who, are, who are working. It's, it's a wage for work, but it's raising that wage until it's at a level that generates a, an income that's adequate for the worker's uh, family or household to survive on. Mm -hmm. These are not mutually exclusive. It doesn't right. have to be, well, are you for a basic income or are you for a living wage? It can absolutely be, um, be both as, as, as a piece of um, increasing the well-being of working families. Mm -hmm. Let, okay, so let's go to, let's, I just kind of want to go to some extreme um, logical, you know, the extreme logical conclusion of some of these thoughts. Let's say we did get a basic income that, uh, all in depending on where you live, could guarantee enough money for everyone to have housing. Um, you know, what does, what do you see that, what would that do to like the housing market? Uh, will there be enough homes? Um, and I, I'm just asking this because this is, you know, I kind of know the answer, but I want to know what you think on uh, the, the logical extreme of that. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. So you, you might be worried, you know, what, what happens if, will there be too much money chasing too few uh, mm -hmm. goods? Um, I'm not worried about that. Our economy has been massively productive and pay hasn't gone up very much. There's a lot of room in this economy for working families to have more money, more income to, ch to chase goods with. You, it is possible to imagine a situation where people have so much, where, where, where people have so much money that we start to uh, you know, hit, hit the limits of what the economy can produce. But our economy is producing about two and a half times what it produced uh, the year I was born, and workers are making about the same amount. So there's really no, there's really no shortage of goods in the economy. There's really kind of a shortage of uh, purchasing power for, um, for, for working households. Basic income would be, would be a good way to boost that right off the bat. And I think, you know, if um, people had money for, for housing, for um, for, uh, for, for health care, yeah. um, for, for, for their necessities, uh, it would be very, you know, that would just be a, a very good thing. And, you know, mar markets are at least under the current configuration able, would be able to provide those if workers were showing up with, uh, with more money in, the po in their pockets, uh, more money in their wallets to, uh, to make those purchases. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. No, and it, it, it almost seems, um, it seems like common sense, um, in the sense that um, especially the middle class, we're consumers, we're going to spend that money that comes in. It just basically makes sure ensures that we don't have to live in poverty or that we don't have to be homeless. But essentially, it's still going to be spent. I mean, this is a this would be a windfall for capitalists, but it seems as though capitalists may be. Um, why would capitalists not be in favor of this? That's the question. So, um, so there are a couple of uh, angles to this. Uh, so one is that capitalists uh, will like having workers who can't be that picky or choosy about the jobs that they take. Mm. And to be honest, what I say is one of the benefits of a basic income guarantee is that will allow working people to be a little bit pickier about the jobs they, they agree to do. Mm. So uh, jobs where the hours are, are abusive, you know, either because there are too many hours or too few hours or not hours when... Uh, or you know hours that you can't control that get adjusted, you know with a uh, half hour before the shift is uh, before the shift is going to begin. It's a lot a lot of misuse of workers 
abusive workers in, 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 in that domain. Um, so uh, employers, uh, to be honest, kind of like having desperate employees in some uh, in, in, in a bunch of ways. So um, so employers may be a little bit reluctant to not have uh, you know not have workers who are looking starvation in the face, and a basic income would uh, would relieve workers of that um, of that burden of that of that basic kind of terror or fear of of not subsisting. Mm. So I think in the long run, that's going to lead to jobs that are much more creative, that make much better use of our, our kind of our full capacity as human beings. But in the short run, um, it would be a big shift in the balance of power, I believe, between, uh, between employers and employees. Big shift towards employees who could be much, uh, much pickier, even, you know, e- even to have a buffer to, for example, strike on, right? That one of um, yeah. the reasons that uh, the playing field is not level between workers and employers is, is because workers, uh, you know, have to uh, pay rent and pay groceries. And it's very frightening to say, I'm going to withhold my work. Um, in you know in the, in the context of the strike something like a basic income guarantee would give a little bit more slack in the life of a worker a little a little bit more uh cushion to live on and would allow them to um you know act collectively and uh and advocate for themselves and again not take really terrible you know not be forced to take really terrible or, or abusive jobs so that would shift the balance i mean i don't think the thing that i i, I joked about I, mean, I wasn't joking. Milton Friedman did uh, come out in favor of something like a basic income guarantee. I think it would, this will only emerge from a political struggle mm-hmm. at this point that mm-hmm. workers will have to, to push very hard for for this. That's why I think it's important to think about the range of alternatives. Why I mentioned a minute, you know, living wages as 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 a complementary alternative. There's more, there's more than one way to man. Uh, there's more than one approach that we could take mm-hmm. towards addressing poverty and evening out some of the inequalities that have developed. You know, so the other side of the equation, um, and I think this dovetails perfectly into some of your research, uh, is the cost, right? Um, so I'm looking at an estimate here uh, that if we went with a basic income of about $10,000 per adult, uh, that would equate to $2.47 trillion annually. Um, so there's always a question of how do we pay for this and why would we pay for this if we had to pay for this uh, with deficit, deficit spending, ultimately adding to our debt, which leads to uh, one of your articles that I found <laughs> fascinating, which was discussing uh, does high public debt uh, consistently stifle economic growth? So talk about the debt portion. And if it is financed with debt, is it something that we should just uh, completely avoid? Sure, that's a great question. Let me say a couple things about financing uh, basic income, and I'd be happy to move on and talk a little bit about uh, public debt. Um, so where is this money going to come from? So the numbers, uh, you know, uh, $2.5 trillion sounds like an enormous amount of money. We actually live in a very, very prosperous economy. I and mean, what's remarkable is how much stuff the economy, how much goods and serv- how much goods and services the economy produces every year, and how little of that has uh, has accrued uh, to working people mm-hmm. in recent years. So there's a lot of room. This is not really demanding debt or deficit. It's really d- demanding a um, a uh, more equitable distribution of a growing product. So that's one remark. Okay. Second remark, I think this is really worth thinking about. One of the most successful existing basic income guarantees, it's not on the scale that we're talking about. It's about one, it's about one tenth the size is that the state of Alaska operates what's called the Alaska Permanent Fund, which is a payment on the order of slightly more than $1,000 per person. Again, per man and child, so if you had a family of four, being a fourth, you, you receive about a $4,000 annual payment from the state of Alaska if you live in Alaska. Um, and that money is a, a piece of the royalties on Alaska's oil revenue. So it's, uh, from the sale of a natural asset, uh, a piece of that is given to Alaskan just for being Alaskan. You don't, again, you don't have to work. It's not payment for a service rendered. It's a claim that Alaskans have on um, on uh, the uh, oil, the massive natural bounty uh, of Alaskan producing oil. Oil mm-hmm. has other problems. We can talk about that some other time. <laughs> but there are um, 
ways that uh, universal basic income could be funded as a natural asset dividend. So, for example, we could introduce carbon taxation, which um, mm. would probably be very helpful, unlike the uh, oil fund in Alaska. Carbon taxation might be very helpful for constraining climate change, but it's also going to create a large pot of money. And uh, you can see companies are already uh, sharpening their knives, thinking yeah. that they might get a slice of that for themselves. Well, another thing that could be done with that pot of money is it could become the uh, it could become the revenue base for a, for a basic income. Um, it could be distributed again to people just for being people, and it would make an, this enormous con potentially enormous contribution to, uh, to 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 family well-being. Mm. So that kind of carbon revenue, carbon tax revenue recycling could be a, uh, a uh, revenue source for a uh, basic income guarantee. Um, so, so I just throw that out there as yeah. a way to think about maybe doing this without incurring any deficits or debt. Hmm. Uh, but you did ask about deficit and debt, and that is, uh, that is an area where I've done research. Um, you know, I guess I uh, come from a basically Keynesian perspective yeah. that uh, it's actually very important for governments to run to run deficits and thereby increase their debt when the economy is slack. And to my mind, our economy remains very slack. Right. I think it was, you know, we, we had a disaster in 2008 over the last uh, eight years or so. But even before that, we were running an economy that was just, you know, just too slack. And you can see that in high youth unemployment rates, pockets of unemployment um, you know, in parts of the country that have chronically high unemployment, parts of our cities that have chronically high unemployment. We could simply run a much hotter economy. We'd have to run deficits to do it, but we would grow very quickly. And my prediction is that the debt would not grow that fast relative to GDP, because we'd be putting more people to work, we'd be creating incentives for companies to, to increase productivity. So we could run deficits, we could run the economy much tighter, many more people employed, without much of an impact on debt. Um, hmm. I'll uh, pause. And, yeah, and, and much of an imp impact in terms of debt, our debt to GDP ratio or uh, debt generally? So, that would re so I'm referring here to public debt mm -hmm. as a fraction of GDP. Okay. Um, yeah. And so I think that's, you know, uh, so, I, I, I wrote this paper with a, with a student um, and with a colleague in which we rebutted sort of terrible scare stories about mm -hmm. public debt to GDP and how if that goes, you know, just a little bit too high, it's going to crush growth. So right. we rebutted that case. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the student found, uh, our student Thomas Herndon found uh, some very serious mistakes in, pa in a paper that had kind of generated the scare of public debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That said, I do, not I, I, I do not believe that public debt can rise infinitely and endlessly. I think that you know, it's, it's important to think about how big public debt becomes. It's important to think about what the public debt is run up for. So if we're running up a public debt because we're educating people better, right. because we're taking care of our health, and that's going to pay because we're build, rebuilding, uh, rebuilding bridges and roads, or even better, building a green uh, infrastructure right. or a smart energy grid. That is debt that is wisely taken on. That's not a problem. That's easily going to pay for itself. You know, if it's public debt that we run up, building up a war machine or something like that, or giving really large tax cuts to rich people, that's not a sensible uh, public debt. That's probably a bad idea to, to take it on, even if it doesn't create an enormous drag, which is you know, really, I guess, what, what our paper discovered, is that you do not get an enormous drag from public debt. Um, it, you know, there, there's, no, there's no disaster level. We, it's not a number we really have to keep our eye on very carefully. Uh, we really want to think about things that matter a lot, like the wages of working people, what's the unemployment rate, what's the hidden unemployment rate, um, you know, can, can we stimulate more growth? So if I if I could dare try to summarize <laughs> here, um, you're, <laughs> you're saying so long as we're spending on things that will drive GDP growth um, relative to our level of debt. It's not something that we have to be fearful of, that that debt, that investment that we're making via the debt is actually something that's going to continue to help the economy grow. That's the first thing that I'm hearing. Absolutely. And the, the way out of big public debt problems in just historical case after historical case has been getting the economy back on track. Mm -hmm. And by on track, 
I don't mean 2005 and six before the great crash. I mean, the great crash was terrible, but I mean really back on track, the kind of across the board income growth that we saw in the period from the end of World War II until yes. the early 70s. Yeah. Um, that's the kind of back track I mean. Yeah. And so you've actually also answered all the questions that we literally had lined up <laughs> for you because you talked about the type of uh, that was my question, the type of spending that we use this debt for. If we're investing in human capital, if we're investing in infrastructure, it has a more stimulative effect than if we were investing in tax breaks for people who may not even spend that or they may just accrue that wealth and sit it aside. So how we spend it Absolutely. matters. Mm -hmm. The evidence is extraordinarily strong, particularly at the moment, you know, thinking about education, thinking about health, maybe thinking about the climate and the environment more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, if we spend on those things, there's going to be a lot of employment. There's really, we, we're, the economy will grow, there will be an enormous amount of employment. They're just, they're just, there is just, um, we, we I, you know, we'll need to invest in those things if uh, we're going to survive, uh, if our climate's going to survive over the next 50 or 100 years uh, with, uh, with, with our, our civilization uh, intact. Um, there will be plenty of jobs if we can steer investment, if we can, if we can steer investment uh, toward, towards, um, towards building a sustainable economy, you know, through education, through health. Mm -hmm. and right now, I think we really need to worry a lot about investing in uh, in climate in fair ways and then the last thing uh before the last... I, the, before i let you go was um talking about um you you already answered it but i just want to bring light to it again that this is not to say that debt can just grow out of control it's that our current ratio and in your uh, your paper the ratio is at 90 percent our gdp our debt to gdp ratio is at about nine ninety percent that's not a terrifying level, but you're saying it can't just go um, infinitely higher. So where would that threshold yeah. be? Where do you think, where is the danger zone for that ratio? No, there, you know, so there is no threshold. We're not going to walk off a cliff one day and find out, uh-oh, shouldn't have borrowed that last dollar, you mm -hmm. know, off the, off the cliff. Um, you know, I think that you want, we want to make sure that that ratio is not growing you know, out of control over a long time. Um, again, the best way to get that done is to stimulate the economy and to get the uh, denominator, right? So it's public debt divided by GDP. Yeah. We need to make the denominator bigger. Uh, and don't worry, the public debt uh, will, will, take care, will take care of itself. So, um, so I absolutely would not point to a number. You know, at the moment, we're at a uh, public debt to GDP ratio that is large, but not unheard of by historic standards. It's substantially below the level at the end of World War II, which right. was a very high level of public debt to GDP. And it was at the beginning of a period of uh, enormous growth and success right. for the American economy and then growth and success enjoyed across the income distribution um, by, by, by rich and poor alike. So, um, so I just think it's not, it's not an indicator that I think we should be focusing on very much. Uh, you know, I think it will, it will effectively take care of itself if we are um, taking care of our economy uh, well. Hmm. Awesome. Um, and, and, you know, I guess I have to dovetail this and put a ribbon around it. Would you consider uh, basic income being the type of debt that uh, is stimulative enough to um, continue uh, to push the economic growth to sustain that high level of debt? Yeah, so certainly in the, uh, to sustain a high level of growth. Um, mm -hmm. So certainly in the short run, uh, our economy is running, I, I think continues to run quite slack. I think some basic income would be uh, beneficial in terms of stimulating income. I think in the longer run, the idea of basic income really is more about um, have our values as, 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 as people and the kind of jobs that we want to be working in, mm -hmm. the idea that we want to put pressure on employers to um, offer better jobs than, than they have been, the idea that we want to free people from, um, you know, from the, the, tyranny, the tyranny of bad work. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think most people would like, would, would like to work uh, would, and would like to work at interesting jobs that kind of make full use of our capacities as human beings. Yeah. Probably not as many hours as most people, as many people work. So I think that, you know, again, basic income guarantee could be, um, 
combined with thinking about reducing the work week, uh, combined with uh, living wages for, for, for work well done. I think it's definitely a piece of that puzzle. It will be stimulative, um, again, because working households are much more hand to mouth. So yeah. when that basic income comes in, it it's will get spent at the butcher and the baker and uh, help uh, put, put the butcher and baker uh, to work uh, as, as well. Um, so I think it can it can play it can play a piece uh, it can play a piece in that. I do think we also need to think about what's the sustainable basis mm-hmm. for it. Um, I don't you know necessarily think it should be uh, debt funded debt. over long. Yeah. In the short run, debt funded is great. I mean, uh, if you need when you need to stimulate a sagging economy. Awesome, Professor Michael Ash, who is the chair of the, um, of the Department of Economics at UMass at Amherst and the professor of economics and public policy. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, having this conversation, uh, even on the backside of all the terrible things we had to talk about at the beginning of the show. It's good to actually talk about some things that actually can push progress forward. Would you tell everyone how they can get up with you, whether it's Twitter or social media? What's the best way for anyone who wants to have this type oh. of conversation to get up with you? Thanks. So uh, I am on Twitter. Um, uh, I think at UMass Econ is the best way to reach me or the easiest one to say on the air. Okay. My, uh, my handle is too long. So at UMass Econ is my Twitter handle. Uh, I'm listed in the department at UMass Amherst Econ. I welcome emails. Please don't hesitate to write. And last, let me put in a plug for my environmental, my corporate environmental performance rate rankings, which is toxic 100 dot org toxic 100.org and you can see work that uh, my colleagues and i have done on reading companies in how much uh toxics expose us to through air pollution and how that's divided uh between um the rich and the poor and hmm. uh disproportionately of people of color absolutely that's uh so that's toxic 100 and and it takes me to um the political economy research institute uh over there at umass uh, at Amherst. So toxic100.org. Right. Okay. Yes, that's awesome. right. All right, Professor, thanks again thanks, for joining man. me. Yeah. It's been a pleasure, uh, and we definitely have to do it again. Thank you for having me on. It was really an honor. And it was, it was an honor. Awesome. All right, folks, thanks so much for joining us. That's the end of the show. Um, I think it was a great conversation. The first time we talked about basic income on the show, but it's something that we'll probably talk about a little bit more each each and every week because uh, we're not just doing journalism in a way. We're doing some type of uh, – well, anyway, I'll stop there. Good night. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog, join the Progressive Army, and support The Benjamin Dixon Show. If you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Consider becoming a Patreon. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show.